This morning, we come to another statement Jesus made to clarify his own identity. And this one is, of all of them, probably the most familiar. If you remember Mel Gibson's movie uh, a number of years ago, The Passion of the Christ, toward the end, uh, scrolled these words. And it was like the ultimate moment in the movie when having seen Jim Caviezel do an absolutely incredible job portraying what Jesus went through for you and for me. And the whole time I was sitting there grimacing and yet wide-eyed wonder with tears just coming down my face thinking, he did it for us. What a champion. Then these words come up. And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Hmm. What an incredible statement of his own identity, accurately bringing us to some ultimate words that even the disciples were not ready for for the first three years that Jesus was with them. This was a timely statement that made only sense at this moment, at the end of his ministry, immediately before getting to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's already served the bread and the cup, He's already washed the disciples' feet. He's already said, as I have loved you, love one another. And now he says to his distressed disciples who have been told by him in the past hour, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I'm going to prepare a place, a place And the disciples are distressed. They're asking a number of questions. How are we going to find where you are? How are we going to get there? Was this all real? Whether they're asking that one yet or not, they certainly were when they saw him mangled and shredded and spit on and crucified. Was this all real? Was it true? And is, how are we going to go on, and is life going to still be worth living? All of those questions were swirling. And to answer and address their troubled situation, he begins as it's recorded for us in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. Now, this is perhaps one of the most misunderstood words of Jesus because it almost sounds like he's condemning a troubled heart, like you should never feel that way. Obviously, that's not what Jesus is saying here. When our hearts are troubled, we need to say, my heart is troubled. We don't need to fake it. We don't need to stuff it. We don't need to pretend that we've got it all together. When we don't understand what's going on, we need to admit we don't know what's going on. So Jesus is not saying, oh, come on, shame on you people. You shouldn't let your hearts be troubled. Now, we know that's not what he's saying because a couple chapters earlier, Jesus said, my heart is troubled. When he was talking about Judas, the one who was going to betray him, he used the same words of himself. He said, my heart is troubled, deeply troubled, because one of you is going to betray me. Now, if it was condemnable for Jesus, for, for anyone to have a troubled heart, he had a troubled heart. So it wasn't evil. 
But what, when Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled, what he's saying is, you don't have to stay there. I'm going to give you something that will meet you in your trouble. And so he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to take you, and you know the way. Now, <clears throat> the verse immediately before this incredible self-disclosure of Jesus, Thomas, you got to love Thomas. He makes us feel like maybe there's room for me too. Thomas is the one who asks the honest questions. And he says in the verse 5 of John 14, he says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Now, you got to admit that was an honest question. But it's really totally contradicting what Jesus said because Jesus just said, you know where I'm going and you know the way. And so Thomas said, no, Lord, you're wrong. We don't know where you're going and we don't know the way. But Jesus is not condemning to Thomas. He does not condemn an honest question. And I just want to say to all of us who are in process over Jesus, and who is Jesus? If you're still asking honest questions, I want you to know there is room for you in God's heart. God does, he never casts out a skeptic. God welcomes you with a seat at the table to ask any question you have, any honest question when it comes to Jesus. And Thomas proves that. Even contradicting what Jesus just says, Thomas still asks the question, Lord, we're going to be honest with you. We don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Now, Jesus does not tell him how to find the way. He says, I am the way. Jesus does not tell them where to discover truth. He says, I am the truth. He doesn't tell them how to find life or meaning to life or fulfillment in life. He says, I am the life. Now this morning, this is, you've got to admit, this is the ultimate three-point sermon. If, if you can't preach this three-point sermon, there is no hope for you as a preacher. It's, it's right there. And when Jesus, sometimes we put them all together, like he made one statement. You know, it's kind of like you're the true way of life. Well, that's true. He is the true way of life, but that's not what he said. This is not one self-disclosure. It's three distinct in fact, when you look at it carefully, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Uh, by the way, I don't know if any of you watch Jeopardy, but did you know this question? This verse was on Jeopardy this week. For any of you Jeopardy buffs, this was one of the questions. In Latin, Jesus didn't speak Latin, but if you take what Jesus said and translate it into Latin, he said, Via et veritas et vita. The question is, what are those words in English? Who would know that answer? Take a guess. The way, the truth. Anyway, it was on Jeopardy this week. Just thought you might like that. Right. But let's take them one at a time. Jesus said, I am the way. How often have we thought, oh, Lord, we, we come to him in our anxiety. Lord, I don't know what to do. I've got to make a decision here. I feel totally overwhelmed. It's as if there is no way out. There is no way. 
Now, if, if we were going to uh, be honest with ourselves this morning, most of us would admit sometime in the past six months we've, we felt that way. We face situations that we don't know how to solve them and how to find the way. And maybe in a, in a moment of desperation, we even cried out to God, God, show me the way. But notice, better than showing us the way, Jesus reveals himself as the way. Now, there's something extremely relevant here for the early disciples, but just as much for you and me. The early disciples were in a major moment of transition, and for them, it was the ultimate moment of ambiguity. They had been following Jesus. They'd left their nets. They'd left everything to follow Jesus, the physical Jesus on earth. They knew nothing of the Jesus ascended up in heaven. And now they are in this major transition from following the physical Jesus to following the Jesus who is seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. This transition was the ultimate moment of ambiguity for them. The ultimate moment of despair and questioning. And so now for the first time, they needed to know that Jesus didn't just come on earth to show us the way, he came as the way. And when he introduces this, he says to the disciples, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He puts the whole emphasis on himself. And so now for the first time, the disciples are having to make this transition from the physical Jesus on earth to the living Christ who is God at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Now, this is where you and I get to know him. And in the middle of our ambiguity, in the middle of the unknown of life that you and I live with, how are we gonna pay the bills? What are we gonna do about this? Which college to go to? How am I gonna solve my marital issues? all the questions of life that you and I grapple with. What Jesus does for you today is he says to you, I am the way. You can trust me. In the middle of your unknowns, living in the darkness and ambiguity of life, I am the way, and I'm the way maker. How often you and I have run to God in desperation saying, God, give me, I need an answer. And those prayers are fine. But in the middle of those prayers, God first wants to say, I will show you the way, but first I want you to trust me as the way. That Revelation puts everything else in perspective. I am the way. Um, I'm still kind of a dinosaur when it comes to technology, but I've got to say, when I got my iPhone, it was a major boost. Um, so many parts of this phone, I just, it, it's so incredible, all that we hold on our devices in the palm of our hand. Now, <clears throat> I don't get that many apps, but one for years my boys have been telling me, Dad, you gotta get ways. <laughs> and I still use Google Maps. Well, Google Maps is great. You put in the, the address and it tells you how to get there. But it doesn't tell you how to get there the fastest. Now, it, they've upgraded a little bit. But Waze, oh, it's unbelievable. 
It'll tell you if a possum got run over in the road. It'll tell you if a car broke down. It, it tells you stuff like it's unbelievable. This one is worth getting, folks. But what's even better than ways on your phone is the way living inside of us. He's the way. He's not just an app, he's a person. And he is the way maker. Ways will find the fastest way. But the way maker will make a way where there seems to be no way. Jesus says, I am the way. Then he says, I'm the truth. He's the truth about God. He's also the truth about you. And he's the truth about your life situation. This is why several have said this particular statement of Jesus is the greatest philosophical statement ever made. Philosophers, it's all about truth. And the most popular philosophy today is really skepticism, arguing the absence of truth. And ultimately, what Jesus is saying is, apart from me, Everyone who sees life accurately should embrace skepticism. But when you discover Christ, you find the truth. You find reality. Truth becomes ground zero. When we encounter Christ, we don't have to play games, we don't have to pretend, we don't have to pose, we don't have to wear masks, we can come out from hiding. For the first time, we can be ourselves. Because of Christ. It's interesting to me that Jesus waited until about 12 hours before his crucifixion to make this statement. Within a couple hours of saying, I am the truth, he'll stand before Pilate. And Pilate will question him. Are you the son of God? And Jesus will respond. And then Pilate, interrogating Christ, asks him this question. What is truth? As a good Roman, Pilate was a philosopher, and he was asking the ultimate question. It's the question that every philosopher asks, what is truth? And then, 12 hours after that, Christ is dangling from the cross, and he'll breathe his last, and one of the centurions looking up at Christ says, truly, this is the Son of God. <laughs> 25 times Jesus not only said truly, but he doubled it. He said truly, truly. 25 times. And they're all in the Gospel of John. This month you may want to read through the Gospel of John and mark every time Jesus said truly, truly. He didn't have to. You know, it wasn't like if he didn't say it, it wasn't true. Everything Jesus said was true, but just so that he would be emphatic. And the reason he did that is because he is the embodiment of truth. And then I'm the way and the truth and the life. Jesus spoke a lot about life. 
Many of the I am statements, the living water, the bread of life, the resurrection and the life that Stephen did so well preaching for us last Sunday, and now the life, the life. I am the source of life. I give meaning to life. He, he gives life now, and he gives it eternally. It's a quality of life. It's fulfillment. It's satisfaction. It's authenticating the value of our lives is all because he is life. The Apostle Paul would go on and say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Even in the Old Testament, David said, your love is better than life. It was another way of saying, God, you are my life. Your love for me is better than physical life. And it was all pointing to this moment of self-disclosure when Jesus says, I am the life. Hallelujah. When, I, when you take these three statements, I am the way and the truth and the life. Somehow I was thinking, man, Lord, help me today to put these in us as a church family, to drive it home in such a way that we would personalize these, that they wouldn't just be theory or principles, but a living reality inside of every one of us. And as I thought about this, I, I, I'm fascinated by the fact that this is prom season. You see more limousines around these days than at any other time of year, pulling into little subdivisions. And, and who gets in? Not a big shot, but a high school student. And they go driving down the road and they pull into another subdivision. And out comes a, a beautifully dressed high school student. And they get in the limousine. The average high school student in Georgia will spend about $870 to go to the prom. That's average. Some of you guys, I'm sure, are way above average. And some of you say, not me, I'm like, uh, I'll show you how to get a deal on, the, on doing the prom for less than that. Well, I read some touching stories that, that totally fascinated me. 18-year-old Lindsey Preston of Lawrence County High School, just across the border in Alabama, she asked Don Jones to the prom. Now, many of us may not know Don Jones, but he plays for the uh, San Francisco 49ers. But he was born and raised in Alabama, and she thought maybe she stood a chance. Well, Don Jones accepted and last week took her to the prom. Now, she's 18. He's 27. She's in 11th grade. He's an NFL ball player. She's white. He's black. She has Down syndrome, and he's a classy guy. He took her to the prom. He loved her. She was a classy woman, and he was a gentleman. She had the time of her life, and so did he. He even taught the other 11th grade boys some dance moves they had never seen before. <laughs> now, that, that touches me. But the one that hit me even heavier was Katie Kelsenberg, a senior in Stillwater High School, Minnesota, who asked none other than Dwayne The Rock Johnson to the prom. 
Three days later, and he, she did it by tweet. Three days later, she didn't get a tweet back, but she was sitting in her first period class and over the intercom. These words, a pre-recorded message. We're starting school today, a little fun and with a surprise. You're probably thinking, why is The Rock making an announcement over our school PA system? Well, I have a message for a very special young lady, Miss Katie Kalsenberg. Unfortunately, during your prom on May 5th, I have to be in Hawaii filming Jungle Cruise. But I've rented a movie theater for you and your best 233 friends. We're going to rent it out and let you invite all your friends, 233 of them, for the premiere showing of Rampage. Plus all the Coke, popcorn, and candy you can handle. Can you imagine? Katie's sitting there. Everyone's looking at her. Even the other classes come to the door and, and look at Katie. She perks up. She hears this. And later she says, I can't believe it. I was so surprised. I just kept thinking, he saw me. He saw my tweet. He knows who I am. I love that story. What an honor for a young lady to feel like something that her idol saw her tweet and acknowledged it in such a cool way. Well, whether you're a high school student or otherwise this morning, I want you to know you have a God who doesn't just notice you because of your tweets. He knows you inside and out. And he is the rock. And he doesn't want to just rent out a theater. You're the theater. And he wants to live in you and live out his life in you and through you forever. And he wants you to feel special. You've been noticed. And he says to you today, I am the way. For you, I'm the way. For you, I'm the truth. For you, I am the life. And the same dignity that these young women had because they were honored by somebody famous, somebody bigger than life, you are honored by someone infinitely bigger than life. He is life itself. He knows you. He loves you. And he is for you, the way, the truth, and the life. Now, the next words, no one comes to the Father but by me. That's true when we first come to salvation. No one is saved apart from Jesus Christ. This is true of salvation. But it's also true every time we pray. Every day when we call on the Father, we are always coming to the Father through Jesus. But it's not just true for getting saved and every prayer we pray, but this is going to be true for all eternity. For all eternity... The only time we will ever see the Father is in the Son, Jesus Christ. That will never change. We will always and forever see the Father in the Son, Jesus Christ. He will always be showing us the Father. That will never change. I'm sure I wasn't the only one in the room that admired Barbara Bush. Several touching stories but I want you to know that the day 
or the day before she died. I'm not sure which. But it was right at her end. She said to her son, Jeb, I believe in Jesus. And he is my savior. I don't want to leave your dad, but I know I will be in a beautiful place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to know, I believe in Jesus, and he is my savior. No one comes to the Father but by me. Thank you, Lord. What a passage. What a savior. As you leave here today, you don't have all the answers to all your questions, but you can leave with the way. We're all in process, and these are process declarations. None of us are finished products, but in our process, in the ambiguity and often confusion of life situations, Jesus wants today to show himself to you as the way. He's more than the app on your handheld device. He is the living way and the way maker. He wants to show himself to you no matter where you are in the process as the truth. He and he alone is able to show you the truth about God, but not only about God, about yourself so that you can live authentically and today to be your life, your reason for living. There are times when we'll all get depressed where we're all thinking, is life worth living? Maybe I'd be better off dead. But Jesus wants to convince you today that he is the life for you and your reason for living. Take hold of these statements. Take hold of Jesus. For him to be in the middle of ambiguity the way. In the middle of crisis or confusion the truth. And even in the middle of depression he is the life. And the longer we walk with Christ, the longer we follow him, the more these characteristics of Christ become ours. The more it's not about having all the answers, but we trust the one who does, and he is the way. More than seeking for truth, we find reality in Christ. And more than searching somewhere for the meaning of life, he is life itself. And it's no wonder we as a church call our small group communities life groups. Because when we gather in Jesus' name, he is the life, and the groups are life groups. They're life-giving groups. Amen. Father, we take your word today and feed on it. We take the reality of who Jesus is and we thank you that Christ is in us and we are in Christ and we walk with Christ and get to know more and more about the reality of what it is that Christ is the way, that he teaches us to be truth people, that we don't have to be afraid of expressing sincere questions or even doubts, that we can raise anything and you respect an honest heart because you are the truth. And Lord, when we do despair of life itself, we thank you, Jesus, the time and time and time again that you show yourself as the one we've been looking for that you redeem even the, the worst of circumstances and the worst of 
our messes, that you come and manifest your life-giving presence to us. We open our hearts to you this morning, Lord, and respond to you. Jesus. And in Jesus' name, we come to receive all that is ours from the Father. Just hold your hands out to the Lord, church. To you be Jesus, the way. Take Jesus as the way. To you be Jesus, the truth. Take him. To you be Jesus, the life. Take him this morning.